The buzzing noise of the intercom by my bed roused me from my sesta. I reached over and hit the button. There's a lady here who wishes to see you, sir. My secretary's disembodied voice came from the machine. I'm a little busy at the moment. Colette, ask Val if she can see her for me, will you please? Valerie is my PA and usually handles most of my visitors nowadays. To be honest, I wasn't busy at all. I'd turned into a bit of a recluse and was having my afternoon nap. Colette was aware of that, so it was unusual for her to disturb me. The lady says it's personal and very important, sir. What she has to discuss, she said she can only discuss with you, sir. Damn it. Tell her she'll have to make an appointment for, oh, I don't know, next week sometime. The lady says it's urgent, and she is adamant, sir. Oh, bother. All right, I suppose I'd better see her then. Show her up to my office in about five minutes. I got off my bed, gave my face a quick rinse in the bathroom to wake myself up, and then made my way through the penthouse to my private office. I looked out of the window at the view over the city below. Damn, I hate this place. I hate every blasted thing about it. Goodness, I think I hate everyone on the seventeen floors below me as well, even though they all work for me. Colette entered the office without knocking. She never did knock nowadays because I was rarely in there. I'm just the figurehead of this organization now. The only reason I was here in my penthouse suite was because I had nowhere else I wanted to go and nothing that I really wanted to do. The very nice-looking young lady who Colette was supposed to be showing in strode past her into the office in an officious-looking manner. But I think the sudden grandeur that she found herself in took her by surprise and knocked the wind out of her sails. I could see she was unused to and uncomfortable with the environment she suddenly found herself in. Mr. John Crawford, she asked before Colette had time to make her official introductions. That's me. My name's June Parsons, and I'm with Slaw Social Services. I'm not sure, but I think I was supposed to be cowed by her statement. And what can I do for you, miss, or is it Mrs. June Parsons from Slaw Social Services? Please call me June. We try not to be too formal. I could see confusion on her face now. I think I was not what she had been expecting, nor were the surroundings she found herself in. This woman was used to dealing with folks on the other end of the financial spectrum, and she appeared to be totally out of her depth here with me. Very well, June. You may call me John. Now, what can I do for you? Oh, excuse me. Okay, Colette, you can leave Miss Parsons with me. Thank you. Colette, with a curious look on her face and a wink of her eye, turned and left the office, closing the door behind her. My visitor was quite beautiful, and the gold diggers had used some very interesting ways to get to me in the past. Mr. Crawford, John, I'm sorry. John, I'm with social services in slow. You have said that more than once already. Now please tell me, how can I help you? There is. Um, where do I start? She said, looking around the room. The splendor of the place was obviously not what she had expected at all. Look, I've got a case on my hands. There are two children involved and a mother who attempted suicide. Maybe it would be better if you read this note. It was found beside the mother. She handed me an envelope containing the note. It was more of a letter than a note. I sat back in my big swivel chair and opened it. My dearest John, the first line said, and darn, I immediately knew whom it was from. My memory jumped back eleven years to when my once happy life came to a sudden end. As I remember it, I was having one heck of a morning. A water main had burst in King's High Road, and the whole damned area had gridlocked as folks tried to find their way around the closed road. I was almost an hour and a half late when I tried to sneak into my office unnoticed. It was the second time that week that my journey to work had been a nightmare. As I entered my office, June, my secretary, well, she wasn't really mine. She looked after three or four of us, whirled on me. John, where the heck have you been, and why haven't you got your mobile switched on? Oh, I must have forgotten to charge the thing last night. That was becoming a habit of mine lately, too darn tired to think straight when I got home in the evenings. Tony Jordan's been looking for you since nine. 
he's got a real bee in his bonnet over something. You'd better get your rear up there pretty smartly. Bothering. That's all I needed, that pompous little man on his high horse. Ever since his father retired, he and his brother thought they were God's gift to the industry. The truth is he had no idea how to negotiate a contract or keep the customers happy. I was wondering whom the little fellow had upset now. Oh, John, thank goodness you've turned up. I've been trying to track you down all morning. You've really got to do something about your timing, you know, Tony Jordan said as I entered his office. Well, if you hadn't moved the office from Slow to Chiswick, I wouldn't have to sit in traffic jams every morning and evening. I thought to myself, but of course I didn't say it aloud. We all think these things, don't we? Sorry, Tony. There was a burst water main in the high road. Well, I got here on time, he said, rubbing it in. Of course he did. He had an expensive town flat paid for by the company just a couple of blocks away, where he stayed during the week. I was tempted to retort, but again, I kept my thoughts to myself. Anyway, something's gone wrong with the Johnson job. They're late on delivery again. I need you to fly out there and talk some sense into Johnson's board. You know, or some oil on the waters. They're threatening to take their contract elsewhere again. If that happens, heads will roll. Not only here, but at the plant as well. You've sweet-talked Johnson around before. I'm sure you can do it again. And just why aren't you going yourself? I thought, while you're at it, take your brother Robert with you. Between the two of you, you're killing this company. Once again, I kept my thoughts to myself. I really wished I could think of a good reason why I wasn't saying them. But if I did, I'd be out of my ear, wouldn't I? I'll give Simon Johnson a call. I'm sure he'll come around. We've been doing business with him for years. No, you're flying out there on the 12 o'clock flight. Old man Johnson has retired, and his nephew Paul Johnson has taken over as chairman of the company. Neither Robert nor I can go. We've both got a very full calendar this week. A 12 o'clock flight. There's no way I can make it. I've got to get home and pack first. And besides, I'm supposed to be taking Sally to the theater this evening. She's been asking me to take her for months. Well, you'll have to take her some other time. Don't worry. The company will reimburse you for the tickets. The play finishes its run on Saturday night. Sally's been driving me nuts to take her for weeks, but I've been so tied up getting the Carter contract sorted out that I haven't been getting home until far too late in the evenings to go. Tonight was the only day we could get seats for. If I go to New York, I won't get back before Friday at the earliest. Sally's going to be upset, I thought. Then she'll have to go with a friend or something, won't she? Sally knows as well as anyone that the company needs the Johnson work. It's nearly half our turnover. You'd better call her at the factory and get her to go home and pack your bag for you. You'll never get home. And then back to the airport in time for the flight. Cheeky little fellow. I thought as I left his office. I'd started working for Henry Jordan straight out of college. It had been a pretty small concern when I joined the staff. Jordan and Sons Machine Tools. Henry Jordan had gotten in on the ground floor some years back, when Maggie Thatcher declared that industry had to stand on its own feet, and the bank started calling in company overdrafts. Starved of working capital, British engineering firms went to the wall in droves. Henry Jordan was one of the vultures who bought up all the redundant plant and machinery, reconditioned it in his own little factory, and sold it on at ridiculous profits to companies all over the developing world. Henry Jordan was a typical dyed-in-the-wool conservative, I think there was a lot of the profits that somehow disappeared into offshore accounts. It wouldn't do for a good Tory to pay too many taxes now, would it? Once the bankruptcies started to become a little thin on the ground, Henry Jordan changed the company's modus operandi. He became an agent for companies who wanted to sell machine tools into Europe. Simple. Really, the machinery was imported into the country in pieces, then assembled and delivered to anywhere in the EU. Things went well for the company until Henry's twin boys finished university and came to work at the firm. Until they joined the company, I had been Henry's number two, his assistant in all things, both above and below board. 
The boy's arrival spelled a change. Henry was not a bad old stick. He didn't put his boys over me in the company hierarchy at first, but they both seemed to resent that. Oh, they were pleasant enough to me, but I knew they didn't like the sway I held with their father. Henry Jordan floated the company on the stock market and made a killing out of it. That was the only time he actually upset me. I thought he would have sent at least a few shares in my direction. But he didn't. The other thing that didn't happen was I was not made a director. Both brothers went on the board, but I didn't. Then Henry had his heart attack. At the hospital, he asked me to keep an eye on the boys. Some hopes, Henry, I thought. If you'd given me some shares and put me on the board as well, I might have had some influence over them. Of course, I never said that to him. It was plain to my eyes that he was on his way out. Henry retired immediately and passed away three months later. The moment the lid of his coffin was closed, the boy started making changes, none of which I thought were good ideas, but there was little I could do about it. They rented flashy new offices in Chiswick, and most of the admin and sales staff moved down there. Tony ran that department, while Robert took over the running of the factory completely. In doing so, he inherited Sally as his secretary. She'd been the factory manager's PA for some time. But the factory manager didn't stay for long because Robert was on his case all the time. I can't say I was very happy about Sally working for Robert Jordan. It wasn't something I could put my finger on. But I never did like the way either of the brothers looked at her. Maybe it was jealousy, or maybe it was just that I didn't like either of the brothers really, but I sensed something. Sally was five years older than the two boys, but she was a striking woman, even if I do say so myself. Sally appeared to get on very well with Robert. Too well if you ask me. No, I didn't think anything untoward was going on. But as I really didn't like the boys, I would sometimes make comments about them. Sally would spring to their defense, and there we had the recipe for trouble. The truth is, as the company got busier, and I was rushing about all over the place keeping customers happy and sorting out new contracts, I think Robert saw more of Sally than I did. So she saw his side of any problem well before they got dumped on me. Okay, back to the Johnson contract and my short-notice flight to the U.S. I called Sally to give her the good news. I think they probably heard her reaction at Chelsea football ground. I know it deafened me. But you're taking me to the play tonight. You promised. What the heck did you volunteer to go to New York for? This was another issue I faced whenever I was asked to go somewhere. Sally somehow got it into her head that it was something I chose to do. I never could understand why she thought I would volunteer for these exhausting trips. But from our discussions, it was obvious that she was convinced I did. I didn't volunteer, Sally. Tony just ordered me to go. Surely you know what the problem is with the deliveries on the Johnson contract. Hasn't Robert told you? There are always problems nowadays. But why do you always have to keep volunteering to sort them out, especially when we're supposed to be going to see the play tonight? I'm getting fed up with the way you treat me lately. What about my play? See what I mean? I had just told her I was being sent to New York, and she still insisted that I'd volunteered to go. I'm afraid I got angry because she wasn't really listening to what I was saying. To be honest, Sally, I don't give a darn about that play. Our jobs, yours as well as mine, are on the line here. If I can't calm Johnson's board down, the company's going to be in serious trouble with no orders. Now don't blame me because your lot in the factory can't turn the stuff out on time. This was the problem with separating the two parts of the company. It had become an us-versus-them culture. Unfortunately, I was with the us, and Sally was with the them. It was a recipe for disaster. Now please go home, pack that bag for me and then meet me at the check-in desk at Heathrow at 11, please. There was silence on the other end of the phone for several moments, and then, in a very controlled voice, Sally said, You'll get your bag, and maybe a few other things you didn't bargain for as well. I'm not your servant, you know. The line went dead. Why did I do that? Why did I shout at Sally, and why did she shout at me? Darn. I knew I needed to apologize to her when she met me at the airport, 
but that didn't happen. I was waiting at check-in at eleven, but there was no sign of Sally. Ten past came and went, with still no sign of her. The girl at the desk was just about to close it when Sally finally arrived. She strolled through the departure lounge, as if I had all the time in the world. Darn Sally, what took you so long? I asked, obviously with a sharp tone to my voice as I was very worried about missing the flight by then. But then I realized it wasn't Sally's or my fault that we were having this argument. It wasn't either of our faults that she was disappointed about the play that evening, and it wasn't good for us to part feeling angry with each other. I'm sorry, Sally. I'm just so worked up about this trip. I went to kiss her, but she stepped back from me. We don't have time for things like that. You have to rush off and save your precious contract. Then I heard the girl at the check-in desk say, You must check your bag in now, Mr. Parsons, or it won't get on the flight. I turned back to the girl and went through the formalities of checking the bag in. When I turned back to Sally again, she was gone. How long before the flights called? I asked the girl. Probably about half an hour or so, but I would suggest you don't leave the departure area. I ran in the direction Sally had appeared from, but she must have been moving much faster when she left than she had been when she arrived. At the end of the concourse was the entrance to an enclosed bridge, that led to the short-term car park. I was halfway across the bridge when, out of the corner of my eye, I caught sight of the bright yellow Lamborghini exiting the car park on the ground level below. I could just make out Sally's coat through the passenger side of the windscreen. I knew who was in the driver's seat, even though I couldn't see him. Robert Jordan. He let no one drive his flashy status symbol other than himself. Boy, was I upset. Robert Jordan was too busy to go to New York, but he had time to drive my wife. Goodness, I was hopping mad as I made my way back into the terminal building. Unusually for me, I went into the bar and ordered a drink. After sitting there fuming for twenty minutes or so, my flight was called, and I moved into the departure lounge. For most of the flight, I studied the contracts as closely as I could, looking for the loopholes Henry always put in there that gave us a little leeway on delivery dates and the like. But the boys had been at these latest contracts, and most of those subtle little doors had been closed. I was met on my arrival at JFK by, of all people, Paul Johnson himself, along with Petra, his PA, whom he had obviously inherited from his uncle, and a little entourage of yes-men. I'd met the kid a few times in the past, a bit of a misnomer, really, but Paul always seemed a bit like the Jordan brothers, very young next to me. I really only had five or so years on them, but in the past, Simon Johnson had normally done most of the talking, while Paul had just been one of the other minions who enthusiastically nodded in agreement at everything Simon said, and of course, laughed at his jokes. I was put on my guard by Paul's overly enthusiastic welcome, especially by the group of flunkies who carried my bags and laptop out to the waiting limo. We've put you in the company suite at the Waldorf Astoria, Paul said. S.J. was hoping to see you on this trip, but the timing is unfortunate. He's still on his world cruise. He told me to let you know he'd look you up when the ship docks in Southampton. I remember thinking this was a strange thing for Simon Johnson to want to do. I'd always gotten along well with the old boy, Henry Jordan, and I had met him many times over the years we'd been dealing with his company, but I never thought our relationship was anything more than business. Now that he'd retired, why on earth would he wish to see me? The Waldorf Astoria was always where Henry Jordan stayed over the years, but when I visited New York on my own, I tended to stay in less extravagant places. However, Paul assured me the suite was the company's, so I figured it just happened to be vacant. I couldn't imagine the Jordan brothers spending money on a suite for me. After dropping me off at the Waldorf, Paul mentioned he'd send Petra to pick me up for dinner around seven. Then he and his entourage took their leave. This trip was becoming more confusing by the minute. In theory, I should have been the one asking Paul Johnson to dinner. It was about four in the afternoon local time. I wondered whether Sally had gone to the play on her own. After all, she had the tickets. I called our home number, but as I half expected, there was no answer. 
Thinking it would be about 9 p.m. in London, I sent a text message to her mobile asking if she was enjoying the play and who she had found to go with. When Petra arrived to collect me, she found me on the phone again. I still hadn't received a reply from Sally, and I thought she should have been home by then. There was no answer from the home phone again, so this time I left a message on the answering machine telling her I was going out to dinner and that I'd call her the next day. As I went to leave the room, Petra gently took my briefcase from my hand and placed it back on the chair I had picked it up from. This is purely a social evening tonight, John. Paul would like you to meet his family. He said it was a pity you didn't bring your wife over with you. Petra, what's this all about? I asked her once we were in the car. I could see Petra was thinking carefully about how to reply, and it took her a few moments before she answered. Paul just thinks that since you two do so much business together, you should really get to know each other better, and he wants you to get to know everyone on the board of Johnson's as well. None of this was making any sense to me until I began to suspect that maybe I was being headhunted by Johnson and partners from Jordan and Sons. There was no other explanation I could think of for everyone's strange behavior. The meal was outstanding, with a large portion of Johnson's board present along with their spouses. Afterward, we all moved on to a night spot where some of the party danced. I didn't venture onto the dance floor as I was feeling the effects of jet lag. I'd been up five or so hours longer than the rest of them. However, as the evening went on, I became more convinced that my headhunting theory must be correct. All the board members went out of their way to talk to me and make me feel at home. Petra stuck to me like glue, almost as if she were my personal assistant. Whenever anyone approached me, she would whisper who they were and fill me in on anything I needed to know about them. It was around 2 a.m. New York time when I got back to my room, 7 a.m. back home. There were no messages on my mobile, and according to the reception, Sally hadn't left any messages for me either. I debated calling her but thought it was a little early, considering she'd been out late the night before. I was roused from a deep sleep at 11 a.m. by my breakfast noisily arriving, followed by the ever-present Petra. Once again, she appeared to be as my PA. You have a meeting with the full board at 12. It shouldn't take very long, and after that, Paul would like you to join him for a round of golf. Oh, you do play, don't you? Of course you do. I remember you and Henry playing with SJ. Anyway, you'll fly up to SJ's estate from the helipad on the building's roof right after the meeting. Ho, oh, and Paul wanted to know how much of a hurry you're in to return to London. Well, that really depends on what Paul and the board have to say about our late deliveries. Oh, I think they'll be happy with whatever you say. After all, you're the, um, well, anyway, they know and trust you. Now you'd better get a move on, or you'll be late for the meeting. Petra suddenly lost her usual self-confidence for a moment. She sounded unusually flustered, and just as quickly, she seemed in a hurry to leave the room, or at least to get out of my presence for a while. To be honest, I hadn't been paying too much attention to what Petra had been saying, as I was anxious to call Sally. I called her office at the factory, but the switchboard intercepted my call. The receptionist explained that Sally wasn't in the office that day. Luckily, the receptionist was a temp and didn't recognize my voice. She didn't even ask who I was when I inquired about Sally's whereabouts, simply saying she didn't know. I don't know why, but perhaps out of a sixth sense, I asked her to connect me to Robert Jordan. She informed me that he wasn't in the office that day either. Feeling increasingly frustrated, I called my home number again, but there was still no answer. Then I tried Sally's mobile, but it was switched off. Robert's mobile was also switched off. At this point, I was completely frustrated, so I called Tony Jordan at the Chiswick office. When he came on the line, I demanded to know where the heck Robert was, explaining that I needed him to clarify something about a contract. Tony hesitated a little longer than necessary before replying, Oh, I believe Robert's gone down to Brighton. He's meeting with the directors of Carter Industries today. I think he mentioned taking Sally along to take notes. Tony's reply didn't sit well with me, especially since I knew the contract had already been finalized last week. 
It was all signed, sealed, and delivered. What kind of nonsense was he trying to feed me? However, I didn't voice these thoughts, and instead told Tony that I would probably have to stay a few more days to smooth things over. The moment I got off the phone with Tony, I called Monty Carter's secretary in Brighton. As expected, she confirmed that no meetings were scheduled between Robert and her boss that day. In fact, she couldn't recall them ever having met. Just then, Petra reappeared and urged me to hurry up and get showered and dressed for the conference. I quickly finished my breakfast and dashed into the shower. We were a bit late arriving, but no one seemed to notice. The meeting began with an extensive round of introductions, followed by a tour of the offices. We didn't get into the conference room until almost one o'clock. I have to say that the negotiations were almost a formality. Everyone agreed with everything I said and seemed more concerned about whether I was upset about anything. I got the distinct impression that everyone thought the Jordan brothers were a couple of fools, but that wasn't explicitly stated. Convinced by now that they were planning to make me an offer I couldn't refuse, I was somewhat surprised when no such offer materialized. When the meeting ended, Paul and I, along with a couple of other directors, made our way up to the roof to board the helicopter. Petra, as usual, joined us. She asked me when I wanted to return to England and arranged a flight for later in the day. While on the golf course, I called my secretary in Chiswick and informed her that I'd be staying on for a few more days. Whatever was going on back home, I wanted everyone to believe I was still out of the country. Petra must have overheard my conversation, because she asked with genuine concern, Sorry to be inquisitive, John, but is something wrong? I've noticed that every time you call England, you seem on edge. I'm not sure, but I think something isn't right over there, I replied, although I'm afraid it's personal. We've known each other a long time, John. Can I be of any assistance? You know I can be discreet. Well, you could help me. It would be useful if no one found out I'm flying home this evening. No one in England, that is. If what I fear is happening, I'd like to try and catch them off guard. Oh gosh, you don't think your wife is. I don't know, Petra. We had an argument before I left, and she hasn't been where I thought she should be when I tried to call her. I can't seem to get hold of her on the phone either. It might just be that she's still annoyed with me, but there's also a man I can't get in touch with, and someone else over there is telling me lies. There must be a reason for that. Oh, I see now why you're in a hurry to get back. Look, if anyone from England tries to call you, I'll have them transferred to me. I'm the only one besides Paul who knows you're on the plane this evening anyway. All Paul's calls go through me, so I'll stall anyone who tries to reach you. You can call them back on your cell phone, and they'll have no idea where you are. Thanks, Petra. Now I think I'd better get back to the game. While I'd been talking with Petra, I noticed Paul walk towards us. I had moved out of earshot to make my phone calls. But what confused me was that out of the corner of my eye, I saw Petra make a small gesture with her hand when she noticed Paul heading in her direction. Paul immediately changed direction and began conversing with the other two players. After the game, we went to SJ's mansion for a meal, where I met SJ's daughter, Beatrice, again. I had known B for years, but something felt off. She seemed awkward around me, and I couldn't quite figure out why. I got the sense that everyone knew something I didn't. I began to wonder if I had made a mistake in confiding my suspicions to Petra. Later in the day, we flew back to the company HQ in the helicopter, and Petra accompanied me to the airport. She had arranged for someone to collect my gear. The flight back to Heathrow was uneventful until I landed. A steward met me in the arrivals lounge and told me there was an urgent phone call for me, leading me to a service phone. John, it's Petra. We had everyone calling for you last night after you left. Your wife called, and I told her you were in a conference with Paul. Then later, both the Johnsons called, but separately, and I gave them the same message. Your wife called again and asked if I knew when you would be returning home. I told her I'd booked you on the Saturday evening flight. Was that all right? Thanks, Petra. That's fine. I'll call them on my mobile later 
and give them the same story. Thanks for your help. Keep in touch, John. I'll let you know if any of them call here again. So my wife had reappeared and seemed concerned about where I was. I wondered why she was suddenly so worried. I booked myself into the Novotel by the airport and found that Hertz had already delivered the car I ordered from New York. The company had an account with Hertz, so it was the simplest choice, but the car was booked privately in my name. Not being tired, I decided to take a drive past my house. Sally's car was in the driveway, and the house was dark, as expected since it was just after four in the morning. From the call box on the corner of our road, I called the house phone. There was no answer, and the answering machine picked up. I called four times in a row, and when she didn't answer any of them, I figured it was safe to assume that Sally wasn't in the house. Leaving the car where it was, I walked down to the house and quietly let myself in. A quick search confirmed that the place was deserted. What to do now? The best idea I could come up with was to sit down and wait for Sally to return. I made myself a pot of coffee and settled in the lounge, planning for the coffee to keep me awake. But it didn't. It was the sound of a car's noisy exhaust that woke me just before eight. Through the window, I watched Sally and Robert get out of the car and walk up to the house. It won't take me long to shower and change. Go in the kitchen and make some coffee, will you? I need something to clear my head, Sally said to Robert. Amazingly, neither of them noticed me sitting in the lounge, even though the door was wide open. I guess some people just don't see what they don't expect to see. Sally ran upstairs while Robert headed into the kitchen. I heard him rummaging through the cupboards before he called up to Sally. Where do you keep your coffee percolator? It's on the side, she called back. Well, I can't find it, he replied. I heard Sally come back down the stairs. Oh, you men are useless without a good woman around to look after you, she teased as she entered the kitchen. That's funny. It should be on the side there. I don't think I left it in the... Oh my gosh. What are you doing here? Sally, now in the lounge, had finally spotted me. She stood there, clearly shocked. Oh, I was just sitting here waiting for my faithful wife to return. And now I think I'm going to have a little chat with our guest. I said as I got out of my chair. Both Robert and Sally seemed frozen in shock for a moment undoubtedly surprised to see me when they were sure I was still in the U.S. Robert was the first to react, attempting to make his escape. Unfortunately for him, we had a rather unusual and complicated night latch on our front door, and the lever turned the wrong way. The more he struggled with it, the more panicked he became. I grabbed him and slammed him against the door, making it clear that I wasn't in the mood for any explanations. Sally screamed that it wasn't what it looked like, and tried to pull me away from Robert. I didn't do as much as I could have, to be honest. I'm not naturally violent, so when he tried to curl up on the floor, I stopped. Some people might have taken the opportunity to do more, but that wasn't something I could bring myself to do. Turning the latch in the correct direction, I opened the door and shoved Robert outside. Without much thought, I also grabbed Sally and pushed her outside as well, slamming the door closed behind them. I returned to the lounge, this time heading for the liquor cabinet. Sally banged on the door and rang the doorbell for a while. Through the lounge window, I watched Robert, who had retreated to his car, get out again carrying a travel blanket, presumably to cover Sally. She called through the mailbox, insisting that it wasn't what it looked like, and begged me to let her back in. I had no intention of getting into a shouting match with her, so I ignored her. By then, some of the neighbors had taken an interest in the commotion, watching from their front doors and gardens. Sally, apparently guessing I was in the lounge, changed tactics and began banging on one of the windows, still pleading with me to let her in. Unfortunately for her, she must have hit the window a bit too hard just as the police arrived. The window pane shattered, and she cut her arm quite badly on the shards. It seemed only a moment passed before paramedics and an ambulance arrived, likely called by the police. Soon after, a policeman knocked on the door. I had seen him talking to both Sally and Robert before he approached. Good morning, sir. Would you like to give me your side of this situation? 
he asked. I caught my wife with another man. Do I need to say more? Not really, sir, but the man says you hit him. I did. Wouldn't you? He was in my house. You didn't strike your wife, did you? No, I didn't. I just helped her out the door so she could be with her friend. I thought I was being quite considerate. Another officer who had remained talking to Sally and Robert came over, shaking his head. He doesn't want to press charges, and the lady says no violence was shown toward her. Then he added, That's a nasty gash your wife's got on her arm, sir. The medic says she's going to need stitches, so they'll be taking her to the hospital. She'll need some clothes, though. Will you take them down there for her? Not a chance, I replied. That's her problem, not mine anymore. Let her friend buy her some new ones. He's got plenty of money. Look, the officer said, she can't walk around dressed like that. She's almost undressed. Then she'll have to find someone else to fetch her clothes. You can go up and get them if you like, or maybe your friend would like to come back in for another round. At that moment, I noticed the sound of the Lamborghini driving away, following the ambulance. Oh, it looks like she decided to do without, I remarked. Now, if you'll excuse me, officers, I've got to call the window repair people and my solicitor. The policeman left, mumbling something about hoping they wouldn't be called back later. I called the window repair company, and within a few minutes, someone was there to replace the broken glass. He tried to make small talk while he worked, but soon realized I wasn't in the mood. My solicitor transferred me to a colleague who handled divorces at their practice. She told me she'd start the process, but there wasn't much more she could do until we found out who Sally would have representing her. It all depended on how Sally wanted to handle things. I noticed the police driving past several times during the morning while I was packing Sally's clothes into bin liners and placing them in the garage. I assumed there was some communication between the police and Sally because around four in the afternoon, a different police car pulled up outside the house, this time with just one officer. He didn't get out. A little later, a Ford Transit van driven by one of the guys from the factory arrived and backed into my driveway. Using the remote control, I opened the garage shutter. It was clear what they had come for. Sally, her arm now in a sling, got out of the passenger seat along with one of her colleagues. While they loaded her things into the van, I heard Sally trying the service door between the garage and the kitchen. Finding it locked, she came around and rang the front doorbell. John, I need to talk to you. You've got it all wrong. Nothing happened between Robert and me. John, can you hear me? I know you're in there. Please, let's talk this over. You're making a terrible mistake, Sally pleaded through the mailbox. I opened the door, but before she could say anything further, I handed her handbag to her and then slammed the door shut again. I had already removed her credit cards and house keys. I watched as Sally went to talk to the police officer, who eventually got out of his car. He shrugged his shoulders and shook his head as he spoke to her. After a while, with a resigned look, he pointed to a spot on the ground, likely telling Sally and her colleagues where to wait. Then he came up and knocked on the door. Your wife wishes to speak to you, sir, and you know you can't keep her out of the marital home, he said when I opened it. You can tell her we have nothing to discuss. The house is already on the market, I said, my tone firm. She's decided it's no longer our marital home. If it was, she would have been in it last night when I got home instead of being with her boyfriend elsewhere. Tell her to have her lawyer contact mine. She knows who they are. The officer walked back down the drive and had a short but animated discussion with Sally and her friends. After a few moments, Sally seemed to collapse into her friend's arms, and they helped her back into the van before driving away. The police officer stood there shaking his head as he watched the garage shutter slowly close. He gave a shrug to one of the neighbors who had been watching the scene unfold, then got back in his car and drove away. An hour or so later, Petra called me. I recounted the events of the day, and she expressed her sympathy. She asked what I planned to do, and I told her I was going to divorce Sally and that I wouldn't be able to continue working for Jordans anymore. Petra urged me to keep in touch with her and made me promise to do so.
She also mentioned that Simon Johnson was going to call on me and emphasize that I needed to stay in touch so he could find me. Paul had already told me that once, and I wondered what was so important about this visit from Simon Johnson. It was midnight before I returned to the Novotel. There was no way I could sleep in that house again. It held too many memories. After breakfast the following morning, I called my secretary, June, and asked if Tony was around. She told me he wasn't going to be in the office that day and asked what was going on. I told her the truth, and she seemed very upset by the news. I swear she was crying as I explained. She informed me that Tony had told her I would probably be resigning when I returned, and she got the impression he had stayed out of the office just to avoid seeing me. I found Tony's absence strange. After all, I had confronted his brother, and I would have thought he'd take great pleasure in firing me, since Robert was one of the company's directors, and there was no love lost between us. None of this made any sense. First, my trip to New York, which Tony had insisted on. But when I got there, the Johnson's team seemed surprised to see me. Yes, there were some late deliveries, but no one seemed overly concerned. Then there was Robert going after Sally. Sure, she's an attractive woman, but Robert was known for being quite the ladies' man, usually seen with someone much younger. Sally was at least five years older than him, nearly ten years older than his usual type. I suppose they could have fallen in love. They did spend a lot of time working together, but somehow I doubted that was the case. I went into the office to collect my personal belongings and took the opportunity to wipe the hard drives on both my company computer and the laptop I used, but not before copying the contents onto zip drives. I handed my letter of resignation, which June had prepared for me, to the personnel officer and waited while he arranged for my final salary and bonuses to be paid into my bank immediately. The accounts department was a bit reluctant at first but they soon realized who was resigning. Nearly the entire staff either helped me carry my things to the hire car or came out to wave me goodbye. I had left my company car safely locked in the garage back of the house, ensuring I got everything I was owed before returning it. That was that. I lived at the Novotel for a week or so before I found a flat I liked. The house sold very quickly. It was in a good area, and I priced it for a quick sale. As for work, I decided to take a few months off to contemplate my next move. To be honest, I was still expecting Johnson's to make me an offer and didn't want to commit myself elsewhere too quickly. As for Sally, I saw her a couple of times, and each time we ended up in a heated argument. Correction, we had blazing rows. I would call her out for her betrayal, and she would retaliate. Civil discussions between us seemed impossible. I was surprised she didn't immediately move in with Robert. She didn't move in with him until some months after I kicked her out of the house. I don't know whose flat she had been staying in in the meantime, but the guy I hired to keep an eye on her said she moved in with Robert right after our first big argument at the solicitors. They nearly had to call the police during that one. She probably realized there was no chance of us getting back together after that meeting. Our second major confrontation was when we signed the divorce papers. Sally, looking very different, was already sitting at the table when I entered the room. She was wearing a big winter coat and sitting rather uncomfortably. My solicitor and I sat opposite her while the details of the settlement were read out. Sally signed the papers first, and then they were placed in front of me. As I went to sign the papers, Sally asked, John, are you really sure you want to do this? There are things you need to know. I interrupted, Sandra, what's the point? I don't need to hear anymore. Sally went off on me, calling me all sorts of names. I signed the forms quickly and left the room without saying another word. I had no desire to get into a heated argument with her. A few weeks, maybe a month after the divorce was finalized, Petra called to inform me that Simon Johnson would be arriving in Southampton that weekend. I arranged to meet him at a hotel in town. After the initial awkward formalities, Simon and his wife chatted with me about their recent cruise. Once again, I got the feeling that he had something more to discuss. S.G. was behaving like a long-lost friend, even though he was just a client I had known for years. 
After offering his condolences on Henry's death and expressing his regret about the issues between Sally and me, he mentioned he was sorry he couldn't have acted sooner due to respecting Henry's wishes. That statement hinted he had been holding back. The conversation shifted when Simon's daughter, P, entered the room. She greeted me with a hug and a kiss on the cheek, as usual, then handed Simon a briefcase. B and Simon's wife then left the room. Right, John, let's get down to business, Simon said. What did you think when Henry floated the company and didn't give you any shares? I wasn't sure how to respond. Well, it was his company, and he could do what he wanted with his money, I said. But you helped him build it. From what I know of Henry, you probably went out on a limb for him more than a few times, S.J. countered. I didn't answer, figuring he would get to the point soon. Did you know that Henry owned a large portion of Johnson's through offshore holding companies, and those same companies also held a significant portion of Jordan's shares, Simon continued. This was new information to me, but I decided to keep quiet and listen. Henry told me he didn't have long to live and asked me to try to keep his sons under control, Simon said. But since you weren't on the board, there was little chance of that. Henry purposely set it up this way because he knew his sons would likely bankrupt the company within a year or so. He didn't want your name on the paperwork, fearing they'd try to lay the blame on you. You know that if a company goes bankrupt due to mismanagement, the directors can be banned from holding other directorships. Henry figured the boys would bleed the company dry, and I assume you want the same outcome. What about the staff at Jordan's? They'll lose their jobs, I asked. No, Simon replied. Not if a big American company picks up the pieces. Here's the deal. Johnson's will cancel its contracts with Jordan's within the next week. The next day, one or two of the offshore stockholders will dump a large number of Jordan's shares on the London stock market, which should plummet the share price. A hint will be made to the right bank directors, who will then call in the company's loans. A consortium will step in and buy what's left of the company from the banks. I'll let you guess who's going to head that consortium and be the main shareholder, but no one will know that part, of course. You'll need to renegotiate the contracts with Johnson's. In time, perhaps you might invite me to join your board. A merger between Johnson's and Jordan could put you on Johnson's board as well. How does that sound to you, John? I don't understand. Why didn't Henry just leave the company to me from the start? I asked. Simon leaned back. You would have been fighting challenges to the will for the next twenty years. You were with Henry almost every day during his working life for the last few years. Henry was always a bit eccentric. He was sure the family would claim you had undue influence over him. They even spent a lot of money trying to find money he might have hidden abroad. That's why Henry placed it all in my care. Anyone checking on where your money comes from will discover it comes from me. And since I'm not connected with Johnson's anymore, they can't accuse us of insider trading. I've been on that darn ship for the last six months. So there we are. I'm now the joint chairman at Simon Johnson Associates. I leave Paul to run the American branch and keep an eye on Europe. Both Jordan brothers were declared bankrupt and banned from being directors for ten years. They've tried to set things up a couple of times, but I had people keeping a close watch on them. Robert married Sally, Simon continued. I think he thought Sally would get her hands on some of the money he suspected was coming my way. But since that money officially came into my possession after Sally and I divorced, he had no chance. Once they were married, I applied to the court to terminate her alimony arrangements. After that, they got nothing from me. Their marriage didn't last more than a year. I felt sorry for the twins Sally had with him. I suppose they must have been together in the office after I threw her out. The guy I hired to watch Sally said they rarely met in the evenings. I doubted Robert ever paid her maintenance after he left her. You know how these things go through your mind. I wonder how many years Robert had been with Sally. I saw her pushing a pram in Slaw High Road just a year after I kicked her out. The last I heard of Robert, he was living in southern Spain with the drug squad on his tail, not far from Morocco a fast boat's distance. That's why I tipped off the drug squad. As for Tony, he's now driving buses around London. 
not the nicest job. His wife divorced him after she received information about his little affair. No prizes for guessing who supplied her with that information. Tony's mother, Martha, is living with him now. Do I feel any guilt about Martha losing her income from Jordan and Sons? The question should be whether Martha feels any guilt about her infidelity. You tend to reap what you sow. Sally, the last I heard, was living in a council flat in Slaw, relying on social benefits. I don't know, perhaps she's working on the side. Sorry, that was uncalled for, but it's how I feel. Things took off quickly once we got the ball rolling. Paul and I worked very well together. We were both trained by experts. Henry trained me, and Simon Johnson trained Paul. Over the next few years, we absorbed other companies, creating a large multinational. Paul and I have both stepped back a bit now and let others handle the day-to-day -day worries. Simon Johnson and his wife settled in England. He has a nice estate next to mine, and his daughter B and I hang out together. We're not planning to get married. Been there, done that. B is on the board with Paul, Petra, and me, and we all get along just fine. Petra, by the way, married Paul after his wife died in a car accident. Paul claims Petra married him because she got tired of waiting for me to ask her. So why am I living alone in this penthouse? There's something missing in my life since, well, you know, I kind of live day to day, grabbing opportunities to make money when they come, but there has to be more to life than just making money. Just then, the social worker handed me a letter from Sally. I read through it quickly and then hit the intercom button on my desk. Colette, can you find out if Beatrice is in the building and ask her to come up here? Yes, sir. I think she is in her office. I saw her earlier and haven't seen her leave since. Beatrice was at my door a few minutes later. When she entered the room, I handed her the letter silently. As she read it, her deep breaths told me it angered her. That vindictive little witch, she muttered. Did you have any idea? Not the slightest, I replied. What are you going to do? Beatrice shook her head. I have no choice in the matter. Turning to June Parsons, I asked, What hospital is Sally in? Slough General, June answered. They didn't know much last evening. Sally had taken a cocktail of drugs, just about everything she had in the house. They'd pumped her out, but they have no idea how long she'd been unconscious. The doctor said it would be some time before they know more. And the children? I placed them with an emergency foster mother last night, June said. She'll look after them today. I thought I'd ask you what you wanted to do. Oh, I have to retrieve that letter if she doesn't make it, I said. The coroner will want to see it. No problem, Beatrice replied. Run off a copy for me, then give the original back to Miss Parsons. Colette, get me the general manager of Slav Hospital ASAP, I instructed. Shortly, the phone rang. Hello, I answered. Yes, good. You know who I am. I have a question for you. How much has your hospital overspent this year? Here's the deal, I continued. You have a patient named Sally Crawford. A drug overdose case. If she survives, your hospital will receive a check from me for one million. If she dies, you get nothing. Do you understand? Good. I want no corners cut, no expense spared. Goodbye. Surely they're doing all they can, Beatrice commented. I don't trust these bureaucrats running our hospitals nowadays. You hear too much about how they cut corners. Flashing a million quid at them can't hurt, and I'm sure they'll do everything possible for Sally now. All right, let's go collect my kids. I assume that's why you're here, June. Well, Mrs. Crawford claims they're your children, June said. From that letter, I see no harm in turning their care over to you for now. But until a judge says otherwise, they are my responsibility. You needn't worry. They'll be in good hands, I assured her. You can rely on me to keep you updated. With your permission, we'll take them to my house near Swindon. There should be plenty to keep them occupied until we find out how Sally is doing. We can get up the motorway in an hour or so to visit her in the hospital. I'm pleased you're thinking that way, Mr. Crawford, June said. Let's keep things as normal as possible for the children. 
We made our way to the basement car park. Miss Parsons joined Beatrice and me in the back of the limousine for the journey to slow. We stopped at the hospital first to check on Sally. The doctors were reluctant to commit to any details at this early stage. June Parsons then guided us to the foster home where the children were staying. Beatrice and I stayed in the car while she went in to speak to them alone. Ten minutes later, she signaled for me to join her. Beatrice followed me inside. Kay and Heather, this is your Uncle John. He's going to look after you until your mother feels better, June introduced. Hi girls, this is my friend Beatrice. You can call her Annie, Beatrice added. The two ten-year-olds eyed both Beatrice and me with suspicion. And until your mommy gets better, you'll stay with Uncle John at his house in the country. I think you'll like it there. He has horses you can ride. And a swimming pool, B said. Where is our mother? Can we see her? Kay asked. Heather added, is she going to die? The doctors are doing their best to prevent that. I reassured them. We saw her a little while ago. If you want, we can stop at the hospital so you can see how hard they're working to make her better. They might not let you in to see her, June pointed out. They'll let these children see their mother, I assure you. I said, remember those pound signs we dropped? June dropped off at the station where she had left her car and then went on to the hospital. As expected, the rules were bent to allow the girls into the ICU. They didn't cry as I had feared. In fact, they were surprisingly resilient. Beatrice noted there was a distinct family resemblance to me, which made me decide to forego the DNA tests I had planned. The drive to Wiltshire was quiet. Once they started to feel at home in the limousine, the novelty of watching TV while traveling down the motorway kept them occupied. As we turned off the motorway, Heather turned to me and asked, You're our father, aren't you? I saw no point in denying it. Yes, I believe I am. But I have to tell you, I was unaware of that fact until today. If I had known, you would have seen a lot more of me. We know, Kay said. Mommy told us last week that she didn't tell you about us. We didn't know what she was planning to do, but she said she had been very nasty to you and didn't tell you that you were our father. She said you believed her other husband was our dad. Heather continued. She was crying. That is true, Kay added. Perhaps one day your mother will explain why she did what she did. Do you think she's going to get better? Heather asked. I certainly hope so, I replied. She doesn't want to get better. She wants to go to heaven, Heather said. I can't believe that with two wonderful children like you, Beatrice said. Mommy's tired. She works so hard and there's never enough money. Well, there is going to be now. I said, and she definitely won't be working anymore. See that little house? I pointed as the car entered the grounds of my estate. When she gets better, I'm going to ask your mother if she'd like to live in that house. You will be able to ride horses here and swim in the pool at the big house. The girl's eyes widened as they stared at the mansion. The car stopped in front of the house, and the staff rushed down the steps to meet them. I knew that hurried preparations had been made for their arrival. One of the guest rooms with twin beds had been prepared for them. Beatrice and I were momentarily forgotten as the house staff fussed over the girls and whisked them away. Well, that's a turn up for the books, Beatrice remarked. I wonder why she didn't tell you they were yours. Oh, she must have laid on quite a subterfuge to hide the fact from me that she was pregnant, I mused. Now that I think about it, she must have been showing at that last meeting when we signed the divorce papers. She was sitting at the table all hunched over and wearing a long coat. I remember thinking it was strange for such a nice day. I wonder why she hated me that much, I said. After all, she was the one who cheated on me. How else did she expect me to react when I found out she was with that person? You'll have to ask her if she survives, Beatrice said. The children settled in very well enjoying the attention from the house staff. Every night, I would tuck them in bed and share stories about their mother and me, stopping short of the past year. Two weeks later, I entered Sally's room. She had woken up for the first time the evening before. I placed the letter she had left in her hand and waited for her to wake up. 
I must have dozed off while waiting. Hello, John, she said when she woke. I'm sorry. I looked at her, seeing her stare at the letter. How are my girls? she asked. They're fine. I left them at the swimming pool this morning. They're wearing my staff out. They're two lovely girls. A real credit to you. Beatrice is going to bring them here this afternoon, I added. Thank you. I'm sorry I hid them from you. It was a silly thing to do out of anger, but once it was done, I couldn't think of a way to reverse it. I couldn't think of a worse way than the one you chose, I replied. I'm sorry, but I was desperate. You know I owe thousands of pounds that I can't pay back. Robert left me with so many debts. I think that's why he married me. Because as a bankrupt, he couldn't get any credit. You have no debts now, Sally, I said. I've cleared them all. Those sharks you borrowed from are out of business permanently. Oh, you found out about them. That wasn't hard. They turned up at your flat demanding money while one of my staff was collecting the rest of the girls' things. He told them to come back later, and they got quite a surprise when they did. Rest assured, they won't be bothering you again. Why are you being so nice to me? Sally asked. The last time I saw you was a long time ago, and I was still hurting then. Now it's just an unhappy memory. But I hurt a lot when I read your letter. I'm going to take a long time to forgive you for keeping my girls from me. I am sorry. That's all I can say. As far as the girls know, we're friends now, I said. Tomorrow, if you agree, you'll be moved to my house. I have a couple of nurses lined up to look after you there. When you're fully recovered, you and the girls can live in one of the estate houses. That way, I can see them often. You're not going to take the children from me, Sally asked. I'm not going to take their mother away from them. No, they love you, possibly more than I did once but I'll make sure you never take them away from me again. I'm sorry. That's all I keep saying. But I'm truly sorry for all the stupid things I've done. There's one question I have to ask you, Sally. Why did you go with that creep in the first place? Don't you think that's a question I've asked myself a thousand times over the last ten years? Sally replied. I'm not sure I have an answer. He worked on me very carefully over a long time. Sally explained. I know why he set out to do it. He told me when he realized the girls weren't his. It didn't take him long to figure that out. They look so much like you. He said they couldn't sack you because of something to do with their father's will. They were convinced that you had access to some of their father's money and thought that when you didn't have a job, you would use some of it to start a business or something. They had private detectives watching you all the time. Were they upset when you went to Southampton? and met up with Simon Johnson. Then a week later, the company's four biggest contracts were cancelled. Johnson's among them, I asked. But you knew that was going to happen, didn't you? Sally continued. I think the bank closing on them really took them by surprise. They hadn't expected that one. The next thing was the police turning up at the house. Did you know that Robert charged just about everything to the company? We had nothing, no house car, or anything. Robert and Tony were arrested for misuse of company funds, but I suspect you were behind that. No, Sally. The forces of law moved along their own paths without any help from me, I said. But Robert and Tony were on ridiculous salaries. What did they do with all their money? I'm not sure, she replied. They both liked to play the stock market, and Robert threw money around like water in the clubs. He wasn't averse to a little gambling as well. I think they squandered it all. When they came up with the idea of getting you out of the firm, they planned on you revealing where all the money was that they were convinced Henry had squirreled away. You still haven't explained why you went with Robert, I said. Well, I was angry with you, Sally admitted. Robert was very clever. He pulled the wool over my eyes. Every time you went away, he'd make little comments and let me overhear conversations that led me to believe you had girlfriends all over the place. It's hard to explain, but I'd hear him discussing expenses you'd put through for nightclubs and things. Oh, I'm sure they were legitimate expenses, but it was the little asides he'd make to Tony on the phone that I wasn't supposed to hear. But of course he made sure I did. 
He'd say things like you had a new girl in New York or Rome, and you'd spend a lot of money entertaining her. They had me convinced that when trips came up, you wanted to meet up with your girlfriends. But if you thought I was running around on you, why didn't you challenge me? Because I couldn't bring myself to believe it, Sally said. If I challenged you and you said it was true, what was I going to do then? I wasn't strong like you. I don't think I could have walked away and divorced you. I would have been living in misery. But as time went on, I was beginning to waver in that belief. Then that play came up. You knew I wanted you to take me to it. Well, Robert was sitting there when you called and said you were going to New York. He heard our conversation, and I was crying. So he comforted me. He drove me home to get your bag, and then to the airport. We didn't go back to work. Robert said I was too upset. We went down to the river at Sonning and sat there talking all afternoon. After that, he took me for a meal and to the play that night. I think I must have had too much to drink. I know it's no excuse, but that night I went to bed with him. I'm sure I wouldn't have done it if I hadn't drunk so much. But that's easy to say now, isn't it? I was feeling very low, and Robert made me feel good about myself that day. After all, my so-called loving husband had just flown off to meet his girlfriend, or so I thought. I still thought that until Robert walked out on me. He told me everything about how they set it up. If you hadn't come home that day, they had photographs of Robert and me together. They were going to send them to you anonymously. I knew it was wrong to sleep with Robert, and if it's any consolation to you, he wasn't very good in bed, too selfish. I don't want to know that, Sally. I'm sorry, but he was useless at just about everything, except hitting me. He got quite good at that towards the end. When you came back and found Robert and me together, I was angry. I'm not sure why, but I felt you had set me up. That girl told me you weren't coming home until Sunday. That little tart Petra. Yes, Petra. I was sure she was your girlfriend over there. Well, she wasn't. Don't you think I realize that now? Sally said. But at the time, I thought you set me up so you could catch me and divorce me. That made me really angry. I suppose I was angry with myself. Really. I was going to tell you about the twins the day we signed the divorce papers. I had it planned. I'd sign the papers, and then before you signed, I'd tell you about the babies. That way, it wouldn't be as if I was using them to get you to change your mind and take me back. You would have had the choice whether to sign or not. But you were still angry with me. You know, I think that's when I really should have realized that you hadn't been cheating on me. If you had, you surely wouldn't have been so angry with me for doing the same thing. No, you called me a bloody fool or something, and I lost my temper. I'm sorry for goodness sake. Stop saying you're sorry. I interrupted. What's done is done, and nothing can change it. Will you ever forgive me? Forgive you? That's a question. I might forgive you eventually, but there's no way I'm ever going to forget. But there are two lovely young ladies in this equation now, and we have to think of them. I will be civil to you at all times, and I expect you to be civil in return. As far as the girls are concerned, you are their mother, and I will be their loving father. Just don't bring your boyfriends around my house. There will never be any boyfriends, and there never will be. Ever is a long time, Sally. Sally recovered to a degree and lived in the little house on the estate with the girls until they went to university. Cancer took her a couple of years ago. I don't think she had the strength to fight very hard. I'm convinced the drugs she took in that overdose left her with some lasting damage. Beatrice and I married in the end. Do we love each other? Well, I don't think I love Beatrice in the same way I love Sally. Beatrice and I are kind of soulmates. We're very fond of each other and enjoy being together. I suppose it is love, but not the same kind of love. The twins are grown and married now, and they have children of their own. Beatrice has been designated grandma, a title she believes she's too young to hold. Am I happy now? Yes and no. I could have lived my life out with the woman I loved, but now I can only visit her grave with flowers. Beatrice waits at the gate of the cemetery every Sunday while I do so. Life goes on. 
Thanks to everyone who took the time to listen to today's stories. If you enjoyed it, please consider liking and subscribing if you haven't already. Feel free to share your thoughts on the events in the comments below. Take care.